Well, we've been making our way through Daniel, and um, we're just doing not we're not doing the prophecy parts. Uh, next week we're doing the eleventh chapter. We're going to have a little bit of prophecy in there, but um, all, all these stories we've had in Daniel, it seems like such courageous people, and and yet. You know, the, the idea is to stand, and it's not just about courage. It's not just about, you know, there's a lot of courageous people who take stands for the wrong things, and, and we want to stand for in the right ways at the right time and for the right reasons. And so we, the first week, just to kind of recap, remember we had the one about the diet where Daniel was... Um, suggested that, that he might not eat at the king's table, and the king allowed him to do that. God gave him favor. Then next week we had the story of the giant idol that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar erected and, and then the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down to it and he threw them in the furnace and they survived that because of Christ's presence with them. And then, and then uh, last week we had Daniel standing up to the king and telling him to repent, telling him that if he didn't get his life in order that things were going to go badly. And, it, you know, it hit me this week as we were doing this that we, we, we speak of Babylon and this ancient culture, and, and yet, like it's something out there, and yet, in, in reality, we're really living in Babylon today. A Babylon is used in Scripture oftentimes, especially in the book of Revelation, to kind of signify the world system. You know, the system that we have where the, the, the strongest... The, the most ruthless get ahead and win. And, and the weak are, well, people just use the weak people to get by. And, and that's, that's the world system, you know, where it's uh, the, the end justifies the means, kind of the Machiavellian principle. And uh, we look at our world today, and, and I remind us that we are living as exiles, as, as aliens in this culture. This is, this is not the final result. This was not God's intention, and this is not the final story. And so we need to have that mindset, and that helps me a lot. And, and the reason that it helps me is because I get so upset with what goes on in this world and, you know, I yell at the TV and stuff, and, and just, I just get totally, uh, you know, just kind of out of whack about, you know, evil that's going on. And, and, and I have to realize that it's not, not my job to fight those people, you know. That, that's not my mission here. My mission here is to, is to live for Christ and, and to, to give Him glory and, and to let God do that work. But I somehow realizing that you know this this world is in the midst of transformation and and god wants to use his kingdom people and eventually his return to to set things straight here gives me hope and gives me confidence and helps me from being such a wacko you know then say i wasn't a wacko just not quite so bad of a wacko well today we we introduced uh daniel and the lion's den and most of us have heard this story since we were four and five, and I mean, we tell it in Sunday school. That's kind of a strange thing. You stop and think about it, you know, that you're telling little kids that uh, if you're faithful to God, you might get thrown in with the lions, you know, and so no wonder they don't want to go to the zoo. No wonder they hold on to you really tight at the zoo because they're going like, you know, I've been a pretty good kid. Maybe, maybe they're going to throw me in here. I, I don't know, but it's kind of a strange story. But, but the way that we get it in, in Sunday school, let's be honest about it, it's kind of like a Disney type thing. And the, the lions are kind of fluffy, and Daniel's a really young man, and he kind of, you know, he lays his head down the lions, and they kind of nestle around a little bit. And it's, I mean, that's the way we have to package it for kids, but everything looks so, you know, so harmless. And that's probably how we kind of come to this story today, you know. The, Dan, uh, the preacher is preaching on Daniel and the lions, Dan. We go, oh, isn't that nice? You know, we're going to do you know, David and Goliath next, and we're going to go through all the big stories. And, and, and they do kind of have this mystical character, characteristic to them that, that sometimes helps or prevents us from identifying. And that, that whole idea of Daniel and the lion's den just being a story is kind of a rather late development. I think we got this picture up here. This comes from the catacombs in Rome where the Christians would hide down in the, the depths of these tunnels underneath uh, Rome at times when they were being persecuted and you, you stop and think about it 
The story of Daniel in the lion's den, if you were a Christian and you had been baptized and and then you were arrested for being a Christian and a few of those persecutions there in Rome and then threatened with being thrown into the Colosseum with lions, the story of Daniel in the lion's den is a pretty good story. You know, it's one you want to hang on to pretty good because here's Daniel that's faithful and he persevered. And, uh, you know, it's a good story. Instead of the story, you know, of being kind of fluffy lions, it's a, it's a connection with a man who took a stand because of that the glory of God was revealed in all of the kingdom of Babylon. Now we're going through Daniel 6, and again, I'm just going to kind of read pieces. So if you want to look at it on your phone or, or one of those Bibles there, that's good. Many years have lapsed again. The last time we had a story of Daniel, you know, he's a young man. Now he's in his late 70s or 80s. Okay, so he's been there all of his life. He spent most of his life as a captive in Babylon. Only now there's a different king. The Persians have conquered Babylon, and the great Persian empire is coming to being. And the, the king now is a guy named Darius. And this Persian empire stretches from India down to South um, Africa or North Africa, excuse me, and up through Macedonia and, and parts of, of Europe is what they're getting into. And, uh, you know, there's a different king, and King Darius, he's this administrative genius. As soon as he begins his rule over this enormous kingdom, he divides it into 120 different districts. He puts a satrap. I think that's a neat name. I, I'm pretty sure Satrap probably was the precursor to Mogul, don't you think? Don't you think that first, before we had Moguls, it was Satraps? I don't know. Maybe. maybe. Okay, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. All right. But anyway, they had Satrap was over each of these 120 districts, and then they, they divided all the 120 into three, and there were administrators that were over them. So there were three guys that were over all these 120 and, and Daniel is one of the three guys. And um, here we are, Daniel 6, we'll start 1 through 3. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. That means lose any money. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Now, now throughout the whole story of Daniel, Daniel distinguishes himself, and we learn early on in the book that it's because God has given him favor. But, you know, let's not forget that he arrives in Babylon 60 years before because... King Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile the best-looking, the smartest uh, young men and women out of, out of Israel. And so he rises to the top because of God's favor and his loyalty and his faithfulness to God. And he is over 40 of the satraps, and his, his 40 do better than the other guys. So the king decides that it's going to be to his advantage. He's going to make more money if he puts Daniel in charge of everything. And you know, it sounds like a great promotion, but with most promotions, there's kind of a hitch, and there's a hitch in this one. Um, the reality is that what looks like a promotion from the outside actually becomes a lot of trouble for Daniel. And the other two administrators get jealous, and they kind of go hunger games on, on Daniel. You know, they, they form this alliance, and they say, if we get rid of this guy, our lives will be a whole lot better. And the lesson there is that when I think when God raises you up, that we should expect some opposition. We should expect someone to want to tear us down. Uh, this is known, I found out, as the crab syndrome in America. That's really what it's called, is that others try to pull you back. And, and I, this, what this comes from is, is a real experience that you put a bunch of crabs, evidently. I had a video, but I thought that's kind of trivial. I could explain it. You put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, and one crab tries to get out. The other crabs will reach up and grab him and try to pull him back in. Okay? That's just the way crabs do things, evidently. They just don't like uppity crabs. 
you know. So you know, we, know, we know what that is. It happens in real life all the time. One person in the office gets a promotion, and up until then she's everybody's friend, but the minute that she gets the promotion, you know, all of her so-called former friends, they, what do they start saying? You know, some of you are nodding. You know what this is? They say, well, I wonder how she got that promotion. You know, stuff like that. They immediately, she thinks I got them in my corner. They immediately turn on her because now she's not one of them. Who does she think she is? You know, now she's middle management or whatever. And that's the way things kind of go in the world, you know. They try to pull her back down in the bucket. So it even happens in the church. You know, somebody just really gets, as we used to say, their socks blessed off. All right. God just kind of reaches out to them and is doing something significant in their life. And other people in the church, you would think that we would go, oh, would you teach me? OK, could, could I could I meet you for prayer this week? In other words, could I get some of what you got? And yet what so happens in the church so much is we go, I don't know who he thinks he is. Right. He's all holier than thou now, you know. He's, I don't know who he thinks he is. Well, you know, someday you're going to lose what you got and you'll be like the rest of us, just bitter and bored. We have that that goes on in the church. Or, or maybe you take a stand on something. Maybe you decide that you're going to get out of debt and you're going to give up something for your family. And you're doing it because you think God wants you to do this. You think you've heard from him and you're going to act on it. But other people, they act like crabs, and they do their best to make themselves feel better by uh, about never taking a stand on anything, but just making fun of you. It's the crab syndrome, and if I can't be free, neither can you. And that's what we see happening here in Daniel 6, 4 to 5. Let's read on. These other two crabs, they launched this campaign. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. One of the problems I think that we have in Western Christianity is that we think that if people oppose us, that must mean that we're doing something wrong. I mean, God is lifting us up, and often people are opposing us, and we think that's wrong when in reality something right is happening. Because if we're not ready to face opposition for following God, then we're not ready to be used by God. Let me say that again. If we're not ready to face the opposition, we're not ready to be used. Because if you give yourself into God's hands and you say, Lord, at the end of my days, Lord, I, I want to look back on my life and say that the sum total of my life, that I live for you, yeah, not every minute, not every week, but when you look back, I look back on the sum total of my life, when I'm taking my last breath, I want to be able to say that you were the purpose of my life. And if you do that, you're going to have some opposition. You really are. I used to have a friend years ago who we were in the same profession, and uh, we were uh, slightly competitive in the profession. And I learned over time that if I went to him and asked him advice about what to do about something in this area that we were competitive, I could count that he would always give me the opposite of what I should be doing. Now, I messed up for quite a few years before I learned that, but I call him up and say, what do you think about this? Well, is that a good idea? He goes, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's a great idea. And it come to find out that he knew it was a bad idea. And so, <laughs> me being the mastermind, right, the the rocket scientist that I am. Uh, I learned how to switch that around. And if he would say, do this, I would do the opposite and come out pretty good most of the time. It's the old crab syndrome. Maybe you have somebody like that. I hope you don't. You, you might have somebody someday. So these two crabs went into the king and they say, oh, king, you're looking so good. 
Hail the king. You are the man. And they butter him up, and then they give him their plan. They say, you, you know, king, being who you are, the kingly king and everything, the greatest empire in the world, king of all you are, it would be great if we had just 30 days to pull the whole empire together so we could all be speaking the same language in adoration of you. What if we just worshipped you and your gods and no other gods but those for 30 days? Does that sound good to you? The king, you know, a little pride starts going, oh, yeah, that, what could be wrong with that? Pulling people together, you know, one Persia, Persia strong, go, you know. It's clear plan to catch Daniel and tumble him down from the top because they knew that Daniel was a man of prayer and they knew that Daniel would never ever consider praying to anyone else other than the living God, to Yahweh Almighty, Jehovah, whatever name you want to use. He would never consider that. And their plan will only work if Daniel is faithful to God and his enemies know that he's, he is God's man and that he will never pray to anyone else but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the way I looked at this, and this was confirmed earlier today by somebody else, I see three options here. Daniel could have taken a month off of prayer. He said, you know, I've been praying for 70 years. What's a month off going to hurt? Take a little break. You know, when I come back, I'm going to be much more passionate about prayer. So I'll just take a month off. All right. He could have done that. Or he could have faked it. He could have just, you know prayed silently, quietly, kind of like we do, you know, where nobody can know if we're praying or not. Well, Westerners, we have such an odd way that we pray. You, you understand that uh, in, in Judaism, to pray meant you had one of three postures. You were flat on your face, you were on your knees, or you were standing with your hands raised. Those are the three ways that they prayed. And they never, ever thought about praying silently. Why would you pray silently? Raise your voice. Make your prayer known to God. Pray out loud. And so Daniel doesn't know how to fake it because that kind of prayer hasn't been invented yet. We Americans have invented that silent kind of act pious by closing our eyes. See, they turned their eyes to heaven. And in his case, he looked towards Jerusalem with his hands raised on his knees. That's the way that he prayed. Our third option, he could have continued to pray as he had in the past, hands raised, eyes open, speaking his words out, and known that he would probably meet the lions. Now, here's my question for us. What do you think made Daniel so strong? I mean, take this stand like theirs. He's an old man. He's an old, old man or weak, right? Well, maybe in our culture. Not in their culture. Old men get stronger and stronger and stronger as they're faithful. Let's go on. Daniel 6.10. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open towards Jerusalem. And he continued, continued, kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. How's Daniel so strong? He got his strength from the time on his knees, and he knows it. He didn't make, make it a big thing, make it a, you know, he made a, he was captive in a foreign land for 60 years. He didn't make it that way, faithful to his God without prayer, but he was a, he was a man of prayer. He got there by prayer, living a life of gratitude, living a life of petition, um, and he knew that to give up prayer would be to give up his life. Three times a day, it says he faced Jerusalem to pray. That was what King Solomon had said. He said, if you're ever away and you're fighting a battle, and, and you look to God, look to Jerusalem, look to this temple, Solomon said, as he, as he dedicated his temple there in Second Chronicles. And, you know, morning... Noon and evening, we are to raise our voices to God, it said in the Psalms. So prayer was not just something that he did for others to see, but prayer was this routine that he had. Prayer was how Daniel's faith uh, continued, grew stronger rather than diminish. And he didn't announce his prayers. He didn't strut around out in the street and go, I'm, I'm great Daniel and my God's greater than your God's, and I'm going to show you all how to pray. 
As a matter of fact, I'm signing a kind of petition around that we're going to put prayer back in, you know, the, the schools here. No, he just did what he did. He just prayed continually. He didn't say, I'm holy. He was holy. I'm convinced that the spiritual success of the great faith that Daniel had was due to his daily decision to follow God. So when the two guys rat on Daniel, the king is devastated. And this is kind of a turn in the story maybe we're not expecting. The king admires Daniel. He respects Daniel. Everyone likes Daniel except for these three, three rats, for these three crabs. And the king is in a very difficult place. He, he, he makes, he's made this law, and evidently he can't break this law by the traditions that they have. So Daniel has to be thrown in with the lions. Here we go, Daniel 6.16. Then the king gave the orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast in the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Wow. The king's got at least faith that, that Daniel has enough faith. He's got maybe not faith in Yahweh, but the king has faith in Daniel, that Daniel has enough faith in Yahweh. And the king says, you know, your God will deliver you. Now, can you see what God is doing here in this whole thing? I mean, God is not some kind of magician. God is not some circus act. And that's the way we oftentimes look at this story. There's a purpose in this. And the purpose is, is that the king will see that the God of Daniel is able, and this God is real. And the living God is not some human-made God. And this is all called bringing glory to God. It means that who God is is shown, and everybody sees it. So at early morning, Darius the king is at the lion's den, and, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, skipped over a little piece. The king goes through a difficult night. He, he, he can't eat. He doesn't have entertainment, can't sleep all night. And early in the morning, you know, he's, he's at the, the lion's den. And, you know, he's going to go, hey, Daniel, are you okay? Daniel 6, 22 to 23. King's at the lion's den, and king asks him, are you in there, Daniel? you okay? And Daniel replies, verse 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Because he had trusted in his God. If you do what's right, you can trust God with the results. Now, was Daniel worried? See, it doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us what he's like during this. It just tells us he does it. That's the important thing. But is he worried? Is, is he maybe thinks he's going to die? You think he's afraid a little bit? You know? Did he want to live? Well, I, I would imagine that all of that's true. I would imagine that Daniel is upset, that he is thinking, tomorrow I'm probably going to die. Is he confident? I mean... Uh, is, is this is how we would do it. Is Daniel, you know, walking around that night trying to get all pumped up and going, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he is in me than he is in the world. You know, saying all of his, his scriptures over and over to get all pumped up and in that place of faith where he can do this. You know, I just don't see that happening. That's my, that's my own feeling here. As a matter of fact, I see Daniel as they bring him out to go into the di lion's den. He's going... See you guys. It's been great. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm going to the lion's den, but, you know, wish you well. Bye, everybody. That's the way I see Daniel. I don't see Daniel as going, oh, this isn't going to hurt me at all, you know. But he's ready. He's, he's ready to do whatever it is that needs to be done as he's faithful to God. You know, he has no promise from God that he will not die in the, in the lion's dead. He has no anti-lion um, spray, you know. Uh, 
He's not the lion whisperer. He has no reason to believe that he would not die. The fact is they grabbed him, you know, I, I, I think he probably said, this is it. All right, that's all right. God's sovereign. God's going to do what God's going to do. And I would rather die for God, okay, than live for, for man. And he's, he's ready to go. And the minute they start trying to figure out, you know, the specifics when you live outside of that place where God is sovereign. The minute we try to decide what is God exactly going to do, we start trusting in the what we think God's going to do rather than trusting in the sovereignty of God. If you do what is right, you can trust God that it's going to work out. See, those Christians in Rome, those ones that dared to get baptized and then to be later thrown into the lions in the Colosseum, I don't think their faith was any less than Daniel's. Their faith was just as great as Daniel's. It doesn't always turn out okay for us. But, but the lesson, lesson here, may, maybe their faith was greater than Daniel's. You know, that they actually died in, in the Colosseum. Their deaths glorified God in the same way. Their, their, their death, their, their blood was the, the seed of the church, so to speak. And that's the message of the cross, isn't it? That what looks like a defeat in life oftentimes is a victory. And that the bad things that happen to us sometimes, and we think, this is terrible, I can't believe that this has happened. We find out that we trust God with the results. That it was a very good thing that he is sovereign. And his favor over us is not easily identified some days. So here we are, here's the end. The decree, Daniel 6, 25 to 28. This is how it turns out. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who are living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Not a very fuzzy story, is it? It's not exactly cartoon stuff. You know, the power of the story is about the power that we have if we desire to abide in God, to remain in Him. We are only as strong as we are willing to kneel. Only as strong in this life as we are willing to kneel before Him. And we are not exempt from the lion's den. So here's a personal question to take home as we come to the table today. How are you preparing for the test? You know, you will be tested. Every person is tested. I don't care if you're 10 or 30 or 60. You're going to be tested many times in life. How are you preparing for the test? See, oftentimes we think, well, I'll be ready for what comes by some rending of the sky, that God will give me some fantastic religious experience, some spiritual experience that will prepare me very seldom happens in scripture more often that the test is one of of everyday faithfulness of abiding in christ what are you doing in your life right now that's making you ready to stand for god it's not what you believe it's what you're doing it's where we're going to spend most of lent and after is it's in the doing are we living a life that's abiding? Are we living a life of actions where we abide in Christ and give our chance, give ourselves that chance? Because the, the small things like prayer three times a day for Daniel add up to a big life. It's the small things. Let's uh, have a prayer as we uh, close out this section and, and get ready to, to come to the table today.
all who are thirsty. Dip your heart in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out. 